Okay, I don't know how to just record audio. I'm sure there's got to be a way, but I haven't figured it out. So you can either watch me read something for Joey or you can just listen. Um, real quick before we start, it's been a while since we've read. Um, Joey had asked John to score four touchdowns twice in two games, and he did. Um now, you may have read this with the sub when I was out, but I'm going to read it again. It won't hurt you to listen to it again. I'm Not that you care, but I'm on page 141 at the very bottom when Joey was going to ask John again to score four more touchdowns, and he said, forget it, not happening, okay? <laughs> John had no more four touchdown games that season against North Carolina State in a game that Penn State won 34 to 20, 35 to 29. He scored only three times, but one of those three proved to be the winning touchdown. His final score on the day was a 27-yard twisting, squirming run, which broke a 29-29 tie and put Penn State on top to stay. Earlier in the game, he had run in one from 34 yards out, another from eight-yard line, and as cold statistics in the newspapers, those two longer runs, 27 and 34 yards, might have looked like the kind of figures a fan would expect from Bob Hayes of Dallas in the game-breaking sprint. That wasn't the case with John. He'd covered 34 yards right enough, including one stretch of nearly 10 yards without a hand being laid on him. But for mo most of that run, he'd been hit, spun around, thrown back, and still he'd kept his feet. At least five NC State tacklers had a shot at him, but none could stop him. They bounced off his rolling body as he plowed through the defense, the goal line in sight, his sheer determination to not quit, keeping him on his feet. And though it wasn't a four-touchdown game, it was one of the three consecutive games in which John gained over 200 yards. That's pretty awesome. That day, he set a school record by carrying the ball 41 times on his way to a total of a 220-yard gain. Penn State closed out the season with a 35-13 victory over Pittsburgh. The Lion defense held Pitt to minus 15 yards of total offense in the third quarter. And that offense, led by John Capaletti, tallied 32 unanswered points in the second half to complete Penn State's first 11-0 season. A crowd of 56,600 watched Penn State pour on 24 points in the final quarter. John ran in one from the five. Linebacker Tom Hall returned an intercepted pass for 27 yards and a score. Quarterback Schumann hit Chuck Hurd with a 32-yard scoring pass, and Chris Barr finished the scoring in the 1973 season with a 45-yard field goal. For John, it had been quite a year. In the 11 games, he had scored 17 touchdowns, gained 1,573 yards. His career totals were all the more impressive considering the fact he had been amassed them in only two years as an offensive player. 2,639 yards gained in 519 carries, an average of 5.1 yards per rush. He had averaged 120 yards per game. His total number of touchdowns in two years, 29. Every game of John's career was detailed in a bulging scrapbook Joyce had been keeping. Evenings, Joey poured over the scrapbook, reading items past, pasted in during the preceding seasons, helping Joyce to add new ones as they appeared in the newspapers. After Penn State's undefeated season, more honors began to roll in. Joey kept track of those, too. John was chosen for the American Football Coaches All-American Team. All-American teams voted by Football News, Sporting News, the Walter Camp Football Foundation, AP, UPI, the Newspaper Enterprises Association, and Time Magazine. If there was an All-American team he didn't make, jo Joey Capaletti couldn't find a record of it. Chapter 23. The Associated Press, on the basis of recommendations from its members, radio and television stations, and reports from regional representatives, has selected John Capaletti, Penn State, first team running back, member of the All-American football team. Marty read aloud from the brass-mounted wooden plaque, then reached up to hang it on the nail he'd driven in the wall of the panel den. He had an appreciative audience. His father stood a few feet away, his hands on his hips, surveying the plaque and its center position on the wall. 
Gina and Joy sat on the couch. Looks good, Joy said. It's the one we didn't have anyway, Gina added, and that was true, but the plaque, handsome as it was, didn't actually outline, outshine the many other trophies and awards in the Capoletti Den. What gave it such distinctive character was something that other other than mere appearance. Voted by hundreds of sports writers, it represented the accolades of men and women whose business it was to understand the value of football, among other sports. They were authorities. They took their voting responsibilities seriously. And now, with Penn State having finished an undefeated season, thanks in part to John Capaletti's success, some sports writers were saying that John had an outside chance to win the biggest honor of them all, the Heisman Trophy. Wouldn't that be neat, Jean asked, hugging herself in a shiver of anticipation. I'm not saying he shouldn't win it, said Marty. I'm just saying he won't. Supper, Anne called from the kitchen. How can you be so sure of that, Jean asked. They were going to the dining room. Smells good. What is it? You're worse than the kids, Anne said. If you'll sit down, you'll find out. Joyce was as puzzled by Marty's comment as Jean. Why not? If his record is clearly the best, he ought to. Honey, Martin interrupted, that's not the point. They sat down at the table. The room seemed nearly empty now, with both Michael and John away at school. Joey was missing, too. He was laying on the living room couch, and Afghan tossed over him, watching them through half-closed eyes. You see, sports writers in the Midwest and out on the West Coast will probably vote for guys in their area, Marty explained. But that doesn't make sense, Jean protested. If John's the best, okay, we know that, but those writers have seen John on TV or maybe in some game films. But seeing a film isn't the same thing as being in the middle of all the excitement of a game. And that's where they've watched local players doing their stuff, at a game. Well, I think that's unfair, Joyce said. Anne brought in a streaming, steaming rib roast. There it is, Dad said. I knew I smelled something good. You, Anne said, pleased but unable to resist kidding her husband. You'd eat anything that wasn't moving fast. Joey, it's on the table. Slowly, Joey turned back to the Afghan and got to his two feet. He'd eaten almost nothing for breakfast, two days, in fact, and he was pale and listless. He walked with obvious hesitation in his step and bent forward slightly as if his stomach bothered him. Anne and Dad watched without making obvious their concern as he joined them. Marty was still analyzing John's chances. There are running backs in this country who scored as much as John did. Some may be faster, and a lot of them are bigger, and sports writers who didn't get to see him play firsthand have to go by what they've read in the papers. Statistics. Statistics are proof. <coughs> Jean said, uh-huh, maybe, but Mark Twain said there are three kinds of lies. Plain lies, darn lies, and statistics. Martin, Anne said, frowning. I didn't say it. Mark Twain did. Statistics are good enough for me, Joyce said. Look at it this way. Look at it this way. Oh, thanks. Marty helped himself to the roast and passed the platter on. Sports writers say, sure, 100 yards against who? They don't believe big-time football is played on the East anymore. You don't give sports writers enough credit, Dad said. Joyce was happy to hear support for her side of the argument. Then you think John's got a chance? He smiled with faint irony. No, he said, not much of one. Joyce was happy to hear, well, help yourselves, please, Anne said, passing the baked potatoes around the table. Jean pulled, put one on her plate and passed the bowl to Joey. Joey, it's hot. Will you take it? Joey got off to his feet and said quietly, I don't feel like eating. Can I be excused? He turned and left the room. You go ahead and eat, Anne told the others. She rose to follow Joey upstairs. Well, I think it's amazing the awards John's already gotten, Jean said. Marty agreed. I'm with you, Jean. I'm just saying that I don't think he'll have a crack at the Heisman, too. But I don't, but I don't think he'll get it. My guess is he'll come in about fifth. Fifth? Joey said, don't let Joey hear you say something like that. Oh, if Joey had a vote. The discussion continued amidst laughter. Upstairs, Joey lay in bed with his clothes on. Anne stood in the doorway. After all these years, don't try to tell me you don't like my cooking. I'm not hungry, Mom. Sitting on the edge of the bed, Anne rested a hand on Joey's forehead. Do you feel sick to your stomach? 
a little, but really, it's nothing special. The doctor said the new medicine shouldn't make you throw up so much. I'll be okay, Joey told her. I'm just not hungry. He twisted away from her touch and rolled onto his side. Anne wasn't certain how to take his reactions. His appetite came and went, like anyone's. But Joey so seldom complained that she couldn't tell whether he was only tired or actually in pain. She knew often... She knew that it often helped to steer Joey onto some neutral topic of conversation to get his mind off his physical problems. Then she thought of something else, better than the neutral topics. Did Jean tell you Johnny's driving home tomorrow? Joey swung around, his face suddenly coming to life. No kidding? He's got a project he's doing for school, something for law enforcement course, and there's a man here he has to talk with. Do you think he'll be finished by 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock if... Oh, Joey... You've got your doctor's appointment at three. You won't. I know. Will John be done by then? Why? His nausea forgotten, Joey offered an eager smile. Because I've got plans for him, he said. He was no more specific with John the next afternoon. All he said was, go to the hospital with me, will you? John stood in the kitchen doorway with notebooks in his hand. Hey, wait till I sit down. I just got in. Please, John, please say yes, Joey begged. When John looked at her for an explanation, Anne shrugged. Okay, John said. I don't know why I turned off the engine. He dropped his notebooks on the kitchen table and went back out into the driveway. Joey circled him excitedly. Not even a hint, John asked as he backed the car out into the street. You'll see. Joey said nothing further, but grinned all the way to the hospital. Nothing, John said, made him open up. When they got there, he seized John's hand and dragged him into the building. They hurried down the quiet corridors, John extending his stride to keep pace with Joey. As they rounded a corner, they nearly collided with a gray-haired nurse's aide. Hi, Mrs. Bartlett. This is my brother, John. I'm sorry, John said. I think we're in a hurry. He waved an apology over his shoulder as Joey dragged him on. Suddenly, Joey slid to a stop, looking perplexed. Hey, he's not here yet. Who? Mark? Remember? I told you about him? Oh, only about 9,000 times, John said. If, but he's not here yet. Most of the time he beats me. Now I get it. That's why you dragged me along to see your friend Mark, right? Joey's impish grin returned. Mark's never met any football players. In mock amazement, John said, no, none at all. What a sheltered life. And again, and he asked me if he could get your autograph. No kidding, John. When he finds out I brought you in person, he's going to go right off his gourd. Yeah, I've met people who didn't get excited. Just a minute, Joey ducked above the alcove and trotted quickly down the hall to the nurse's station. A slender black nurse looked up at his approach, a pencil stuck in her hair. Hey, Judy, he said, is Mark in one of the examining rooms? She bit her lip before answering, uh, what? Mark, he almost always gets here before I do. She saw John observing their conversation. Well, why don't you have a seat, Joey? She rose and rested a hand on Joey's shoulder. Then she turned him gently and urged him back along the corridor. Slight and delicate herself, she wasn't much bigger than Joey. From a distance, she might have been mistaken for one of the children who spent so much time in this particular wing of the hospital. You want to meet my brother? Joey asked her. John, come here. This is Judy. She's one of my nurses. John met them halfway. Hi, Judy. She was looking strangely tense, looking from John to his brother and back again. All she said was, hello. Has this one been giving you trouble, John asked. I wonder if she stopped and, Joey, and said to Joey, could you excuse us a minute? Joey was puzzled by her mood. He hesitated, hoping for an explanation. When none was forthcoming, he said, sure. He walked down away and sat down watching them. John and the nurse went a few steps down the corridor where they spoke in a quiet undertone that Joey couldn't hear, their heads together. He had the uncomfortable feeling they were discussing him. He couldn't imagine what the two of them might have to say to each other. They were strangers they had never met before. His confusion deepened when he saw Judy turn and walk back to her station. John stood pensive for a moment before he approached his brother. His face solemn and his hands jammed in his pocket. Pockets. What was that all about? Joey asked. She wanted to talk to me about Mark. John sat down next to Joey. What about him? After only a moment's hesitation, John sim said simply, Mark died last Wednesday. Joey's face showed no change of expression. 
There was no surprise, no shock. There were no tears. His face might have been carved in stone. Then he turned away from John and stared straight ahead, hunting for the right words. John, all of the kids I used to come here with, now they're all new kids here. It's almost as though he were talking to himself. John reached over, put his arm around Joey's shoulders, and they sat together in silence. Ah, that's a tough one. Um, that's to chapter 24. I'll record another one um, later. I hope you guys are all doing well. I love and miss you.